Hello, I'm Esther Gidho Ewart. It's Tuesday, January 24th. This is Africa 54. Somalia's drought and hunger are filling IDP camps to the limit of beyond. VOA's Paul Nadiho describes the situation. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen continues her three-nation Africa trip, planning to visit South Africa following talks in Zambia, where Daniel Tonga reports she received a mixed reception. The Rockefeller Foundation is giving $10.7 million to the U.N. World Food Program to fund school meals in Ghana, Benin, and other nations, as VOA health correspondent Lador Madhu details. All this and much more on today's Africa 54. Record drought and hunger in Somalia are driving thousands to flee for help. The World Health Organization says the influx of refugees at the internally displaced people camp in the outskirts of Baidoa is stretching the overcrowded camp's resources. VOS Bondiho has more. The number of reported disease outbreaks and climate-related health emergencies in the Greater Horn of Africa is at its highest ever level this century, deepening a health crisis in a region where 47 million people are already facing acute hunger. Many parts of the region are battling its worst drought in at least 40 years, with unprecedented fifth rainy season failure now anticipated while other parts are face a flooding and conflict. As a result, many people are losing their livelihoods and relying heavily on assistance to meet basic needs. Idoa is one of the two districts in the states that were, have been on high alert for um, likelihood of sliding into full famine. Because of the co protracted conflict, we have mass displacement of population and, and when we talk about this recurrent drought, uh, what the world is not able to comprehend is that we deal with the same caseload of people every year. So uh, successively, they are losing their productive assets, losing their livelihoods, and becoming poorer and poorer with every drought event. Through its local rapid response teams and community health workers network, the WHO is providing health and nutrition services for the most vulnerable people in Baidoa. This includes a vaccination against infectious diseases such as polio, measles and cholera. We provide vaccines, OR, zinc, albendazole and vitamin A. People are getting some food but need more to meet their needs. Most of the people in these IDP camps are those who have been displaced from their villages and they need vaccinations. For children under five, screening children for malnutrition and referring severe cases to stabilization centers. The teams also focus on raising health awareness among vulnerable and displaced populations. Due to drought, many people are often working for days to reach the camps for assistance. There is acute malnutrition, which um, in this case of drought is caused by uh, household uh, food insecurity. And there is chronic malnutrition, which is also linked to food insecurity and poverty. So children who, have, um, who are exposed to acute to malnutrition have less ability to fight off infections and, and for chronic malnutrition they also miss uh, their development milestones. Rapid response teams and community health workers come from their communities and are essential to delivering services where insecurity and drought prevent people from accessing health care. Paul Ndiho, VOA News. Washington. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is expected to meet South African President Cyril Ramaphosa on Wednesday during her visit to the country. South Africa is the third stop on Yellen's Africa tour following trips to Senegal and Zambia. In Zambia, Yellen held talks with President Hakainde Hichilema. Daniel Tonga has more on Yellen's trip to the country. 
U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen's visit is part of Joe Biden's drive to boost relations with Zambia, where over the years China has been making significant investments both in different sectors, including infrastructure development. Critics say this has created increased competition for Western nations, including the United States. Some see Yellen's visit as an opportunity for Zambia to make a case and attract foreign investment from U.S. to Zambia. The United States have, has made a commitment of $15 billion towards investment in Africa, but each case, each country must be able to make a case to attract investment. So I think the opportunity here in Zambia is for, firstly, for our government to show that Zambia is a good place to invest in, and I think um, this visit will bring out all the issues and concerns that uh, the United States uh, investors might be concerned about in Zambia. You know, uh, uh, is our money safe? Is our investment safe? Are we able to make money and so forth? The visit is also being viewed by others as a demonstration that U.S. considers Zambia as an eco-trade partner with huge potential for trade and investment. Eight years after independence, I think we're not getting as much as we should, you know, from our trade. And America is a very, very important uh, trade partner. You know, she's a very, very important trade partner. And right now with the electric uh, car batteries that the whole world is talking about and Zambia having, you know, those raw materials, having the copper right here in the country which can uh, contribute to this about billion dollar industry, I think it's important that we are looked at as um, equal trade partners, you know. So for me, this uh, visit is very, very important. And I hope that uh, she's going to look at uh, the many things that uh, Zambia has to offer. There are those who argue that Yellen's visit to Zambia has raised more questions than answers. They hold that the visit is meant to push U.S. agenda and fight trade wars between U.S. and China in Zambia. We have more questions than answers in relation to the intent of this visit. We know that uh, uh, she's not only visiting Zambia, she's visiting three other countries. But we know that Zambia is strategically positioned. We are at the heart of the SADC region. And to that effect, we know that there's an agenda to also use Zambia as a, 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 you know, a, a platform for what we all know, the trade war that is existing between the West and the East. Uh, there is an inevitable shift that is taking place globally. Um, power is shifting from the West, power is shifting from, the, from America economically. Uh, and otherwise to the east, uh, China being you know, the country that is leading. Some expect Yellen's visit to enhance Zambia's relations with the U.S. as well as help restructure the country's current debt. We do expect that a lot of things will happen. First of all, uh, the diplomatic and economic ties uh, mm. between the two countries, the U.S. and Zambia, will be enhanced. But also we expect to benefit as a country uh, due to the fact that we expect that our debt will be restructured. Analysts say despite Zambia arguably a ground zero for geopolitical fights between U.S. and China, the visit by Janet Yellen is crucial in helping address Zambia's heavy debt burden with China. Daniel Tonga, VOA News, Lusaka. Secretary Yellen arrived in South Africa Tuesday evening to begin the third leg of her three-country Africa trip. Her agenda in South Africa is deepening economic ties and trade, clean energy, as well as the effects of Russia's war in Ukraine. Tuso Kumalo has more from Johannesburg. This is a very crucial visit for South Africans as it happens at a time where South Africa's economy is really struggling with a lot of electricity uh, challenges where people have to go for hours without electricity. The actual visit, the official uh, business will start on Wednesday where we'll see uh, Secretary Yellen visiting one of South Africa's wildlife parks where the talks there are going to be how can America help South Africa in terms of uh, stopping poaching and of course stopping uh, wildlife trafficking. Then on Thursday, it is going to be a string of meetings where a uh, first meeting will be with the, the finance minister Ino Kodongwana, followed by a meeting uh, with the Reserve Bank governor, uh, Lesisha Hanyaho. 
Then in the afternoon on Thursday, they are going to visit the Ford, uh, the Ford Motor Company in uh, Pretoria, just outside Pretoria, a uh, one of the investment uh, where the two countries will see uh, what cooperating between each other can bring and what more investment can be done uh, in that area. Uh, then she'll wind up uh, her travel uh, on Friday by visiting the coal mining town of Mpumalanga. We know South Africa depends much on coal for its energy and uh, the talks there will be seeing how uh, South Africa can be helped also to venture uh, into renewable energy. So quite a very critical and crucial visit uh, by Secretary Yellen and coming at a time when South Africa really needs investment. Tuso Kumalo for VOA News, Johasbe. The head of the Russian private military contractor Wagner has published a short letter to the White House asking what crime his company is being accused of. This comes after Washington announced new sanctions on the group. Tamara Lindstrom explains. A Russian mercenary group fighting in Ukraine, private military contractor Wagner, fired back at the White House Saturday after Washington on Friday announced new sanctions against the group. White House National Security spokesperson John Kirby said Friday that Wagner, which has claimed credit for Russia's battlefield advances in Ukraine, would be designated a significant transnational criminal organization a move that would freeze any U.S. assets and prohibit Americans from providing funds, goods or services to the group. With these actions, and there will be more to come, our message to any company that is considering providing support to Wagner is simply this. Wagner is a criminal organization that is continuing wide, I'm sorry, committing widespread atrocities and human rights abuses, and we will work relentlessly to identify, disrupt, <laughs> expose and target those who are assisting Wagner. Kirby said the Wagner group had taken delivery of an arms shipment from North Korea to help bolster Russian forces in Ukraine, including infantry rockets and missiles, and that images showed five Russian rail cars that traveled from Russia to North Korea. North Korea's foreign ministry has called the report groundless. On Saturday, the head of Wagner, Evgeny Prigozhin, published an open letter to the White House asking Kirby what crime his company had committed. Prigozhin, who previously denied connections to Wagner, admitted in September that he founded the mercenary army, which has played a major role in the conflict, describing Wagner as a fully independent force with its own aircraft, tanks, rockets and artillery. Kirby said Russian President Vladimir Putin has been increasingly turning to Wagner for military support, causing some tensions in Moscow. We continue to assess that Wagner currently has approximately 50,000 personnel deployed to Ukraine, including 10,000 contractors and 40,000 convicts. Our information indicates the Russian Defense Ministry has reservations about Wagner's recruitment methods. Despite this, we assess that it is likely that Wagner will continue to recruit right out of Russian prisons. Aside from the new sanctions, Prigozhin is wanted in the United States for interference in U.S. elections, something that he said in November he had done and would continue to do. That was Tamara Lindstrom of Reuters reporting. For more perspective on this report, I'm joined live via Skype from Washington by Kwakunwama, Professor of International Politics at American University here in Washington. Hello, Professor Nwama. Hello, Esther. Let me take you back to Secretary Yellen's trip to Africa. What can the United States and Secretary Yellen, for that matter, achieve by visiting these three African countries? So this is an important trip that is uh, designed to reassure Africans that the United States has not forgotten uh, the continent. Um, and it's also meant to follow up on some of the pledges that were made in December when uh, President Biden hosted African leaders. Uh, but it's also to make sure that... Uh, the United States' main competitors in Africa, China and Russia, don't uh, have the continent all to themselves. So this is a, it's welcome. It's a welcome trip, particularly for Africans uh, who are dealing with uh, high inflation and uh, food insecurity and debt crisis and youth unemployment uh, problems. Uh, hopefully, uh, she's not just there to uh, say nice things, but also there to actually provide significant help. Professor, at almost every point, uh, you hear the question of China's presence in Africa uh, pops up. Uh, do you think that 
Africa can work with both China and the United States? Yes, this is important. Africans have to figure out a way of working with both countries because they provide different things. And we have to think in terms of uh, how uh, the help that we get from China complements the help that we get from the United States. And hopefully, none of those can, neither of those countries force us to choose uh, because we need both China and, um, and the United States. And I think that Africans uh, benefit uh, when we have both of those powers engaged. Uh, Professor, let's turn to the uh, issue of the Wagner Group. And uh, the U.S., of course, has designated the Wagner Group that transnational, as a transnational criminal organization. What are the implications of this designation? The implications is that um, sanctions are going to hit not just Wagner, but also countries that deal with them. And this creates a problem for African countries that are currently engaged with them because uh, they, you can't keep dealing with, unless you get an exemption from uh, the United States Treasury Department, you cannot deal with them. But more importantly, security vendors that work with these groups will no longer be able to do so. And some of those vendors also work with African countries. Uh, banks will not work with them. And that is going to be a problem in terms of how to uh, retain their services because they probably cannot be paid because you have to go to the SWIFT system, which is controlled by the United States. But uh, there's another problem. Uh, Wagner itself, as they become more and more um, engaged in the conflict in Ukraine, are pulling their forces out of these African countries. So African countries that are dependent on them for security are going to find themselves really, really vulnerable as, um, as they shift their attention somewhere else. Uh, you're going to have to figure out a way of finding mm -hmm. Right. alternative sources of help. Kwaku, thank you very much for your perspective. Thanks for having me. Noa, Kwaku Noama is a professor of international politics at American University here in Washington. Still to come, the Rockefeller Foundation announces an $11 million grant to the UN World Food Program. But first, Heidi Adams tells us what's coming up on Wednesday's Trade Talk Africa. On the next Straight Talk Africa, we'll bring you a preview of next month's elections in Nigeria. What are voters looking for in a new president? And what changes do they want to see? Also, this week, the United States Ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, will travel to Ghana, Mozambique and Kenya. We'll take a look at what she hopes to accomplish with her trip. Join me, Heidi Adams, on the next Straight Talk Africa. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living. Right here on VOA. In other news, the Bank of Ghana wrestling with runaway inflation is expected to deliver another hefty interest rate hike at its meeting later this month with the country's currency and public finances still under pressure, according to a poll of economists. A military official and a local chief say suspected Islamists killed about 20 people in a village in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo late Sunday. Authorities blame the killings on the Allied Democratic Forces, a Ugandan armed group based in eastern Congo that has pledged allegiance to Islamic State and wages frequent attacks. And Kenyan rugby icon Collins Injera announced his retirement Tuesday after a 17-year career. The 36-year-old Injera is second to Britain's Dan Norton in the Rugby Sevens World Series try scoring charts with 271 touchdowns. The crown jewel of his career was winning the Singapore leg of the World Sevens Series in 2016. Police are searching for the motive behind the shooting massacre at a Los Angeles area ballroom dance hall. Law enforcement are probing the past of the 72-year-old suspect and his relationship to the club. Meanwhile, the death count has risen to 11. Viewers Michael Sullivan spoke with residents about the tragedy that has shaken the quiet community. Family members gathered for news of loved ones. As a young woman who lost her aunt shows a video of her doing what she loved, dancing at the club where she died. Outside the club, community members mourn. 
my heart led me to be here just as a support to this community. I believe when you have tragedies that happen, no matter what community it is, that we have to uh, come together with our hearts, our minds, and our soul, because I believe united we stand, divided we fall. Monterey Park is 65% Asian American, and people get along. This is a quiet and peaceful community. You know, I always felt safe and secure here, whether it be day or night. Police are seeking a motive for the shooting in Monterey Park and for a second failed attack at another dance club in a nearby city, averted when a man wrestled the gun away from the gunman, the suspected shooter, 72-year-old Hu Con Tron, later took his life inside a getaway van. But the thoughts of the residents were with the victims. Because these innocent people, they don't deserve to, to you know, be gone in a situation like, like this. The flags flew at half-staff at Monterey Park City Hall, and one resident came to thank police and first responders. She's saddened by the continuing mass shootings. Sandy Hook, Uvalde, here in Monterey Park, you know, the, the Columbine. You know, I could go on and on with all these different shootings, that mass shootings that have happened over the years, and it, you, you, don't feel it until it hits you where you live. A resident says, however, the community will survive. It's resilient, it, it's strong, it's, it's uh, very uh, family oriented. She says the people are supporting one another. Mike O'Sullivan, VOA News, Monterey Park, California. It's time for a health report and joining us is Africa 54 health correspondent Lino Mudu. Hello Lino. Hello Esther. Hello everyone. The Rockefeller Foundation has announced a nearly 11 million dollar grant to the UN World Food Program to help vulnerable children get better access to nutritious food through school feeding programs. The initiative aims to strengthen school meals for millions of children in Benin, Ghana, Honduras and India. I spoke with Mehdad Esani Vice President of the Africa Food Initiative with the Rockefeller Foundation for more insight. Take a look. You know, school meals are the world's largest social safety net. Um, over 388 million of children are covered currently. We need to do a lot more. Um, and, and so that's an important way to try to meet the food security and nutrition needs of children. What's important to say is that, you know, in the global south, 90% of the budgets for school meals are covered domestically. So governments are showing commitment, um, but we're only covering, you know, uh, less than half the children in the world. So we do need to up our game. We need to cover them more coverage. We need to have better quality meals. And so that implies other countries and bilateral partners need to help them. So uh, talk to us uh, about how the school environment is a strategic uh, setting to address uh, undernutrition among children. I mean, schools are a great way to, to reach children if you want to reach them en masse, uh, rather than a dispersed approach, uh, which is, uh, you know, a household approach. You know, also an institutional market can garner the attention of the private sector, the food processors, the, 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 the supply chain as a whole. Uh, so institutional markets are not small. You know, the world spends $45 billion a year on school meals. You can wave that as a big stick to attract attention, to say, actually, we're shifting. We want more nutritious meals. We want meals that are more homegrown. We want meals that are more sustainable and resilient. So, so I think school meals makes a lot of sense in building a consumer base. And definitely there will be spillover effects where institutional markets lead there will be secondary markets opening up in mass markets. So, so I think it's an excellent way not only to reach children, but to start to shape consumption patterns. So the initiative is targeting four countries, India, Honduras, Ghana, and uh, Benin. Uh, so why these four countries specifically? But, but more importantly, how will the program be implemented in such a way that uh, empowers local providers in the value chain? So, um, you know, we've, we've tried to select countries that uh, we felt um, the school feeding was at some scale, that there was 
uh, domestic support to grow it, that the countries could play an influential role in sharing best practice with others. So some of these countries serve on the the leading task force of the School Meals Coalition, which is a coalition of 73 countries. So if they bring that evidence to the table, we hope that uh, that, that might be influential. Other countries like India, their public distribution system covers 800 million people. So, so th th there is a mix of outreach and influence and, and these sorts of factors that, that have um, helped us choose the initial category. But of course, this is just the initial foray. There, there will be much bigger plays uh, to come. As far as the role of um, sort of uh, local providers in the value chain, um, you know, the, the focus now is very much on the role that local procurement can play in uh, knock-on effects for the rural development. There's a lot of evidence in other countries where this has played an extremely positive role. So this is an opportunity and a challenge. Um, it's an opportunity of new markets uh, for local farmers, but the challenge is we need to help these supply chains be reliable in supplying safe food at the right quantities that are needed. And so that will be a process. Uh, but ultimately, I think that's where governments are incentivized and World Food Programme, our partner, is, is highly committed to this. So the grant is part of the Rockefeller Foundation's Good Food Strategy. Uh, what, what else can you tell us about this strategy and, and, and what can be done in general to help uh, communities become more resilient in the long run uh, and, and help themselves and feed their families and feed themselves? Yes, so, so for the largest part of its history, the foundation invested in fighting hunger and productivity gains. But we found a laser focus on empty calories was not the way to go. And so the, we have the recent good food strategy. Um, and so that focuses on nutritious, sustainable and inclusive food. As, as part of your question about what can local communities do to become more resilient and, and uh, food secure. Um, I think it needs a coordinated action, both at international, national and local level. Um, clearly, farmers need support to move towards more resilient crops, for example, tree crops, um, other kinds of grains and crops that are drought escaping. Um, they're going to need the extension knowledge and the infrastructure that goes along with that. Uh, but I think also governments, at least in Africa where I live, you know, they, they made a commitment to 10% of public finance towards agriculture. We're not achieving that. So there needs to be some more advocacy, perhaps, uh, to make sure that that sort of support is coming so that the right infrastructure, extension systems, the right kind of food trade exists in the region. Because with climate change, we're going to find shifting surplus and deficit areas. We need to be able to move food efficiently between these surplus and deficit areas. So I think these are all part of the equation of trying to become more resilient and food secure. Thank you, Lino, for that report. And thank you, viewers, for joining us today. Have a good night.